Uh, so, how to write a really good BSP layer? Uh, so, um, in, in this uh, scenario, then, Beth is playing bad cop and I'm playing good cop. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Uh, skip that, skip that. I'm Chris Simmons, you know who I am. Skip that. Uh, so, point number one, then, is RTFM. Um, go to this place here, it is a very fine manual. So, that's the, that's the way you need to start. Um, and then what I've done is I've broken it down into basically two things that you need to do if you are a BSP writer. And it's quite simple, you need to keep it simple, uh, which is good for everyone, and you need to not break anything. It's a, they're not breaking things, which is probably the more tricky bit. Now, since I've only got uh, 30 minutes to talk about this, I'm not going into huge detail, so I'm just going through the bullet points of the kind of things that you need uh, to take into account. Um, so the first concept you need is to know about the, o, uh, the OE trinity. Uh, distro, machine, image. And in this context, we're mostly interested in the machine part, because that basically is what the BSP is. And the key concept is that we should be able to change this component for any other machine, keep the distro and the image uh, the same, and it should build and it should produce something that should be bootable. That's the idea. So we're talking, talking a lot about layers here. So we have basically three different sorts of layer in uh, Open Embedded we have uh, BSP layers. So the key thing about a BSP layer is it has a, uh, in conf machine, it has one or more conf files. That's pretty much what makes it a BSP. We can also have distros. So a distro has a distro slash distro name dot conf. And then if it doesn't have either of those things, then it's an anything else. So I broadly call that software, so that's uh, libraries, languages, all kinds of other stuff. You will notice there is another possibility, which is that you could have both a machine and a distro. And there's nothing in uh, OE to stop you doing that, but if you do do that, you're basically broken. So anything which has both a machine and a distro should be ejected immediately uh, and not contemplated. Okay? And there are quite a few examples of that. Beth men men uh, mentioned a couple just now. Uh, I think she's left the, the room, so she can't comment. I've written BSPs. Hmm? She's tired of BSPs. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's so sad. So what goes into the BSP layer? Now, uh, this could be expanded or contracted as much as you like, uh, because uh, it depends how much detail you want to go into. Um, partly because I wrote most of this this morning, and partly because I don't want to bore people, this is fairly light on the detail. But I picked out these as the key things. Any, pretty much any uh, realistic BSP is going to at least have these bits. Obviously it needs a machine configuration, otherwise it's not a BSP. Um, and then usually there's some tweaks made to the bootloader, uh, to the kernel. Unfortunately, we have these things called binary blobs, so we need to uh, make sure they get loaded in the right way. Uh, there may be a whole bunch of other additional things, like configuring the graphics uh, uh, stack, uh, tweaking the uh, GStreamer um, stuff, all kinds of other bits and pieces. Um, but there should be nothing outside of this. In other words, nothing that is not hardware related. Uh, we don't want in here uh, your home automation demo. That goes somewhere else. Um, and I highly recommend Meta Raspberry Pi as a good um, lesson on how to write a good non-trivial BSP. So the Raspberry Pi is an interesting thing. It has a lot of weird stuff in it. It has a peculiar boot uh, mechanism. Uh, it has some strange, well not some strange, but some additional requirements on the way the SD card is, is uh, formatted. There's a whole lot of interesting stuff in there and uh, Meta Raspberry Pi does it pretty well. Sorry, so just, I guess, so does that mean that it's okay to have user, user space apps that are specifically related to hardware in the BSP? Is that, is that what you're saying in the GStreamer? Yeah, so the lower levels of GStreamer you may have to configure to your hardware. 
So not the higher level. So basically no apps, but maybe some libraries that need configuring, maybe lower level stuff. But no, so there should not be any apps at all in, the, uh, in this layer unless there's something really <coughs> peculiar going on with your hardware, which I hope there isn't. So but you might have BB Appends for GStreamer. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming these will all be BB Appends, yes. Yeah. So basically, you have a bunch of BB Appends. So what goes into the DSPs, for example, like custom GStreamer plugins for hardware enablement? Exactly. Plugins is a good word for that. Well, I should have said plugins here, yes. So we're talking about GStreamer plugins for your particular hardware um, uh, codecs and that kind of stuff. That's what we're talking about. Not, not the high-level uh, video player. The high-level video player goes somewhere else. So, first point then, you need uh, to put the BSP layer into a layer by itself because we don't want to get things mixed up, so you go through this stuff here. Um, while you're at it, uh, at the top level, we really want to have a readme file for the BSP, which is a human readable, up-to-date description of what the BSP actually does. Um, and what for it is. And, and what for it is. And one fork it is. Well, yes. Well, I'm, com I'm coming to that. I'm, I'm coming to that. Um, and really, we want some kind of uh, some kind of license, so we know what the license is for the metadata, not for all the other stuff. That all, each package has its own licensing, but this is the the package for the uh, sorry, this is the license for the overall package. Then you will need a machine configuration. So I have just invented this uh, thing, thing called uh, the Nova board, and I have two variants of it. I have a Nova and a Nova Pro. So in my, uh, uh, in my Meta Nova layer, I have uh, in, machine, uh, in Conf Machine, I have Nova Conf and Nova Pro Conf. And yeah, we then select in your local Conf, you then point at whichever one of these uh, you want to build for. And then really, this is the entry point into your BSP. So within these configuration files, they will then bring in all the other things that are dependent on your machine. And this is why we can just change this line here in our uh, local conf, and it will select either of these machines or any other uh, machines that we have in our collection of layers. Okay, the next thing you're going to have to customize most likely uh, is you need to set the bootloader and maybe some uh, configuration for that. So somewhere in your configuration, you'll have something like this. Extra image depends, plus equals uBoot. Uh, why do we do it like this? Well, because the extra image depends has uh, this particular meaning. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a package, but it's not a regular package in that it's not included into the root image. So uh, extra image depends is a way to uh, specify that in OE. So we're using U-Boot here, but that could be Bearbox or any one of the several other bootloaders available to us. And then typically, since we have, um, every board is different, so in most cases, this will actually be the U-Boot from the vendor, whoever the vendor may be, and then we may want to do some uh, further tweaks of our, cell, uh, of our own, so we put that into a BB append in our, uh, in, our mess, in our BSP layer. Kernel. Uh, as Marissa just said, um, there are lots of different kernel configurations for all, excuse me, for all the BSP layers. Every BSP layer always tweaks the kernel in some peculiar way. Now we can argue as to whether we should be using vendor kernels or some kind of mainline kernel. Chances are you actually end up using a vendor kernel. So in my case, I have uh, Linux and Nova, that's my kernel, and I specify the, the, the version here and a few other things. Note that I'm doing these things with a question mark equals so that anybody using my BSP layer can override them <laughs> if they so wish. Okay, we should be flexible. If people want to change things, let them do that. Um, so in this case, uh, since I'm using Linux Nova, which is something unique that I've just invented, then I would need to supply the full recipe to implement 
um, uh, Linux Nova, so there'll be a, something like this, 4.19 BB. Uh, if, on the other hand, I'm basing on a more common upstream kernel, for example, Linux Yocto, then I still want to tweak the configuration, most likely, so I do that in a BB append. Next thing, firmware blobs. Uh, a lot of things don't work until you poke bits of binaries into the right, uh, right registers and right chips, uh, unfortunately. So here's an example, um, actually taken from Meta Raspberry Pi, but I've, I've tweaked it a little bit. Uh, and I have no, no, this is it. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we added dependency in the uh, configuration file, in this case for the Raspberry Pi 3, uh, and this is for the firmware for the, uh, the Wi-Fi um, uh, Mac. And then to uh, fulfill that, there is a recipe down here. So Linux firmware RPI distro. Uh, if you go look in that recipe, uh, it's fairly recent, reasonably well written. It will go and download the firmware from the official uh, raspberrypi.org uh, website. And then it will include that in the right place. It will install that, that firmware blob into the right place into the root file system image. And then when you boot up, kernel will find the firmware, it will load the Wi-Fi, and your Wi-Fi will work. Notice that what we do not do is include <coughs> the firmware blob itself in the, uh, be, uh, in, the, uh, in the layer. Okay, This is nice and clean, we keep the firmware separate from the layer, it's downloaded and it can be updated um, by the Raspberry Pi.org folks. Okay, I could go on some more with that, but that's the kind of bare bones of what you would need to write your meta layer. That's the kind of things you put into your, your, <coughs> layer, uh, your BSP layer. And then we come down to, this is the kind of stuff that uh, Beth was talking about earlier, the don't break things stuff. So, when writing a BSP layer, you need to consider that uh, people are going to use it in lots of different ways, some of which you haven't, you haven't thought of already. Um, and also, you don't want to break stuff that, e that exists already. So, we want to write the, the BSP layer so that it's flexible and doesn't break things. And probably the key point here is less is more. Uh, I think the big mistake that a lot of OEMs make with the, uh, the layers is they just put too much stuff in there because they want to show off all the fancy things that their chip or their board does. That's fine, put all that stuff into a demo layer, which we'll come to in a moment. So, yeah, how do you check that you've uh, not broken anything? Uh, probably the key um, ACID test is that if you can include your BSP layer and then build for a different machine uh, without breaking it, then you're in a good state. Uh, and essentially this is, the, the thing that normally breaks things is BB appends. If you've got a whole bunch of BB appends in there, and that's a bit appending to stuff that is adding stuff specific to your uh, machine, and you're selecting that even when your machine isn't selected, then you're going to break other people's recipes. So, if you can pass this test, you do pretty well. Um, dependencies. People don't seem to be very well, very well aware of how you specify dependencies between layers. And so um, when I was doing this, doing a bit of research for this uh, yesterday, uh, I noticed one fairly well-known uh, BSP layer. It kicked out this kind of thing here. Um, so I just included their, their, their BSP layer without anything else, and it says, oh, you need a Linux IMX. So what they really needed is something like this, so that in their layer.conf, we should have a, a dependency to say that says, this requires freescale layer, and freescale layer includes this file. Now, we could probably work that out without this information, but it kind of makes life easier if you actually explicitly put your dependencies in your layers. There's a handy little tool, which I think was mentioned earlier, called uh, Yocto Check Layer. Uh, it does a lot of interesting stuff, and it kicks out all kinds of uh, weird errors. 
Um, but when it goes well, it should look like this. So in this case, I'm checking my Metanova layer. It says, yeah, okay, this looks like a BSP layer because I've got a machine.conf, um, blah, blah, blah. And then it prints out a whole bunch of other stuff. And eventually it says, yeah, pass. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the list of tests it has. I should have that at hand, but I don't. Uh, but it tests a whole bunch of things. If you get to the pass on that, you're doing pretty well as well. So, yeah, so I said that the BSP layer should have only the stuff necessary for the hardware. So where do you put your home automation app? And the answer is, you put that into a demo layer or a home automation or an IoT layer, whatever you want to call it. You put all, but all, all your demos, all your fancy stuff should go into a separate layer so that we are not uh, constrained to only building uh, home automation IoT stuff. Um, that complicates things a little bit because it means that now in order to use your board you need to have several layers and so there are ways of packaging bunches of layers together. Now I'd like your, your, your a little bit of feedback from this later on uh, but probably the most common way to do this is to use the Android repo tool. Uh, repo is fairly simple to build, uh, to, to, to uh, configure and use. You just a repo point it at the appropriate manifest file and then do a repo sync, it downloads all the stuff, bump, you got what you need. So as a demonstration of this, I actually, uh, this is a board from a company called Digi, who do a whole bunch of, uh, of dev boards, and uh, they do exactly this, this is the manifest, and when I've done the repo sync, I end up with Meta Digi, Meta Freescale, FSL demos, and a few other stuff here, Meta S software update, not Mendra I'm afraid. Uh, QT5, and so on. Uh, actually, while we're there, can I ask uh, opinions? Uh, what do people feel about repo versus, say, uh, submodules or anything else? What's the best way of doing this? What's the, what's the best practice here? I use submodules these days. Submodules. Yeah. Okay. Also, for my belief, Siemens, which is called CAS. Yes. Yeah, yeah th there is, I believe, a tool from Siemens which is called CAS, which also handles that. So Siemens have a thing called CAS? Yep. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nothing to be used more. Okay, I, I, I'm... I'm going to add it to the list. <coughs> so I, I, will, I will add CAS to the list, although, uh, um, yeah, okay, I'm not familiar with that. Hmm. I've seen it used in a couple yep. of projects. Yeah, it's actually in Meta Raspberry Pi. They recently added a CAS configuration for it as well. For Raspberry Pi, okay. I think it's Okay, I'll, I'll check that out. It replaces. It basically replaces repo. It can do some configuration. Um, we are we are not using CAS because for us the, the missing piece is actually we have multiple boards and multiple things we want to do so. But it, for for simple use cases, it could do the trick of any. Yeah. yeah, one of the what I looked at at least, you can include other cast files. That's one of the problems with manifests. Kind of works with manifests, but you kind of have to work around it. But in cast, you can have a base configuration uh -huh. and then have different machine configurations on top of that. You kind of inherit the base configuration. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they can merge them together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so CAS can do a whole bunch of, of manipulations of the of the configuration files based on on the particular thing you you're, you're trying to yeah. That's more okay. complicated because it, it wraps bit big. Yeah. It wraps bit big. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's a CAS build command. Oh, I'm going off this then. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick with repo. Also, a bunch of us. You saw modules. Yeah. Why are submodules better than repo? Um, so with submodules, I can CD into the submodule and very carefully manipulate the repository and send my work upstream easier. Submodules or subtrees? Submodules. Subtrees does something slightly differently. But if you're careful with submodules, you can actually have a workflow that works for doing development. That, that is the careful part. That's the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I'm being honest. But you can try. The problem is the same for all these tunes. He started off saying, keep it simple there, Philip. Yeah. That's the only good. Yeah. And you can try branches now. Keep it simple. I would install Fedora on my desktop and never go into the embedded space. Exactly. And that's a whole new presentation we could go through there. Um, yeah, we're requesting the Debian versus Yocto talk then. <laughs> <laughs> I can still do that, but never mind. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's getting close to the end here, actually. Uh, so, what else? Yeah, so Yocto compatibility, if you're going to do this uh, and do it right, then, um, yeah, actually, the top one is probably that my, my biggest bugbear is that given some BSP layer from, mm, for example, Digi, or Peta Linux or whoever, it's always kind of tricky to know which Yocto it's built, it's, it's based off. I was talking to a bunch of people uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were using a particular uh, distro based on Yocto and they, I, I said, so which version of Yocto are you using? Nobody had a clue. Nobody knew which version of Yocto is based on. It was just blah 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 version blah blah blah. <laughs> um, and it took some little while to, to, uh, to tunnel down on that. So, yeah, there's too much obfuscation going on here. If you're using Yocto, come on guys, admit it. We need to know this thing. Um, and, yeah, you can do this very simply. You just put into your, uh, your, your, your uh, layer.com file, something like this, and this says that we're compatible with this series of Yocto builds up to its use in this case. So that's a good thing. The next good thing you can do is to submit it uh, and to get a Yocto compatible badge. Ta -da! Um, that says that uh, if you put that on the website, you are in some degree compatible with us. Uh, and then it's uh, for extra, extra points, extra brownie points, you can actually submit it to the layer index and then everybody can see that your BSP layer is there. Sorry, just, just a comment, if you know, uh, and this, the, the layer series of kind of requirements, does that work also if you, what happens if you get open embedded uh, layer directly? Like, do you have a kind of a, a release? Yes, it's in the core. Huh? Yeah, oh, so okay. the, the, uh, yeah. they're, they're called as, as poker. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, so the, this applies to OE as well as Yocto, uh -huh. because for historical reasons, OE and Yocto use the same code names. At least I hope they do. And really, the, so the, the final thing then is why bother doing all this stuff? Uh, and the answer is it makes uh, the BSP, uh, the writer's uh, life easier, it makes the OEM's life easier, it makes our life easier as, uh, as supporters of all this stuff. Um, so it makes the simpler for the BSP writer because uh, there's less to write if you keep it simple. Cut out all the junk, guys, come on. Um, also, if, uh, if it's compatible with uh, Yocto, we can recognize what you've done then it's more likely that when you put something on the mail list or one of your customers then uh, that we'll be able to recognize what it is and help out a bit. Um, you're also by making a flexible BSP layer you are increasing the, uh, the capability of your users to combine it with lots of other layers. So they can do lots of things including things you've never thought of. Okay, and that is literally it. Oh, <laughs> I just noticed there's a slice of unknown at time of writing. I will update that later on, as soon as, soon as, as, soon as Phil tells me where to, where to uh, upload this stuff to. Um, so that was it. So we have like five minutes if anybody has any questions or comments. Let, oh, one thing I would just like to say is that, like I say, this is put together in a bit of a rush, to be honest, for reasons entirely up to me, or down to me. Um, I regard this as being a bit of a work in progress. I would like to keep the uh, to to post an updated version of this uh, from time to time, uh, and maybe have it as some kind of reference. Good point. So, what am I missing? How uh, or what, what have I what have I not talked about that I should have talked about? Yeah.
see none of you are listening, were you? <laughs> You said we are trying not to break things. And, yes. Uh, as a technique to check this, we said, okay, try to build the game something which is not in your BSP yes. and see if it's building. Uh, does anybody know, or do you know a way a little bit more problematic or uh, easy to integrate in some CI for, uh, for checking this? Well, I guess you just build one of the machines that's in uh, in the meta layer in, in OE core. If you can build for a QEMU, actually. I mean, by using some signature, which is expected not to change the situation. Yes, that's what the layer, what, what, what the Yocto check layer does. Yeah. It's a really good Yeah, but it's not really good in the screen. It also checks out. Add the layer, it builds again, and checks the yeah. uh, signature. So, so if I change it. Yeah, it, it builds OE core. That's it, QEMU, I don't know. It builds OE core for QEMU. It says, okay, that's the outcome. And then you add your layer and says, is the outcome the same? Oh, cool. I, I, did, oh, I, I, I didn't actually realize it did that. That's fantastic. It just adds it to the layer check layer. Where is it? Yeah, I know that you didn't talk so much about uh, overrides, like machine or BSP specific, specific overrides. That's how you kind of avoid changing things, like if you have a BBFM. It should only be applicable if you are building for that machine or BSP. Uh, yeah, I um, yeah, I, I just literally ran out of time, so I, I didn't quite get around to adding that stuff in. But yes, the the, the answer to the question about BB appends back here. Uh, for example, if you have BB append to GStreamer, that BB append should have an override that's only specific to your BSP. Yeah, exactly. So the, the answer to this question is how do you make, how do you make, uh, ensure your BB appends don't break other things is to use uh, BB uh, sorry is to use machine overrides on anything you do in this BB append, and then that will only do stuff if the machine is set to whatever your machine is, and then all the other machines you build for these won't do anything. So and and there are there are maybe a couple of other techniques around that. I had intended to go into that, but like I say, I, I ran out of time. Oh, just for the future. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. There's also a good talk from Paul Barker from uh, the Yachty Summit, I think it was, yeah. uh, where it's uh, creating friendly layers, and there were some more uh, really cool techniques for separating things, like uh, doing require that is uh, that depends on this show, on machine features and all this stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. worth having a look at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I did actually refer, I did actually have a quick look through Paul's presentation um, like a couple of minutes ago, uh, but I didn't in include that stuff. But yeah, Paul Barker's presentation on this is uh, is highly relevant here. Um, if you have like uh, a K-file running on Raspberry Pi, so I guess you know this machine configuration would depend on the Meta Raspberry Pi. Absolutely, yes. And then if you have another machine which would depend on another thing. Uh, should you just have two BSP layers or is there any way to clever put your dependencies on your layer? Um, or should I just have, okay, do, do, do. What stops you from doing B layer, BSP layer per device? Yeah, that's what I want to Nothing. To, to, write, to, to know what's the best yeah. approach. So are you asking whether you should have a cake layer one has a sets of machines and they don't want to change their build config when they switch machines because they're sharing user space binaries across multiple machines and don't want to build new ones for every machine and they can very carefully force the machines to build for common um, flags so if you've got a bunch of Cortex A9 machines you just put them all in parallel and you don't you want to be able to change machines and the only thing that gets rebuilt is you change machine and machine specific packages, but the rest of your user space stays the same. 
and this is sort of weird for the, the hardware guys to get, is they don't real they think that we should only use their hardware and only use their BSP. But if we're working in a multi set of hardware <coughs> situation, we don't want to keep a separate build tree for every piece of hardware we're working with. Um, and the guys doing binary distros will want to build common packages across multiple sets of hardware. So it really is important that your PSP behave and be able to work in parallel with others in the build tree. It's nothing strange to have a build for 30 machines with one damn gear for five different architectures and with several sub-architectures in those architectures. And open, open the build slash auto and just handle it. And you will get, oh, this this G streamer package is basically ARM v7 one, but this plugin is only is for Nova Pro device, which has some extra hardware code for which this G streamer plugin exists. And all other machines will get this codec as software one, which will be just plain ARM v7 package. So both of mine, I should just have to do two PSP. Yes. If you yeah. have two machines, my job, uh, Which load, are kind of not compatible. Yeah, load both, add both layers, and to build for do, both machines in the same time. I know that Meta Raspberry Pi covers pretty much the entire Pi product line. Which is, so they're all three different machines, so they're all machines. careful not to break each other. Yeah. And if you have a second vendor's BSP, that BSP doesn't contaminate the Raspberry Pi one and the Raspberry Pi one doesn't contaminate it because they're very careful what they override. And that, I, the, the secret is just be very careful what you override um, yeah. because your layer may be used in conjunction with other ones. But I, I, I think the way, so specifically if I have a Raspberry Pi and I've just produced my own cape which has some peculiar, I don't know, automotive CAN bus interface and some other things, uh, the way I would handle the recipe for that is I would kind of wrap the the BS the the, uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, Metro Raspberry Pi layer, and I just in my layer dot uh, as I am a machine conf, I would just do uh, an include of Meta of the Raspberry Pi configuration, and then override any bits and pieces I need with that stuff. Uh, and you can do that. I mean, you you can you, you using. I mean, you you can include. Um, BSP, other BSP layers into your BSP layer and then and then extend that if that's what you want to do. Uh, it's, it's pretty flexible. Okay, um, so I think it's time for a break just now. So uh, if there's any, no more questions, we'll um, go grab coffee.